Welcome everyone to Looking at the East. Thank you for tuning in or watching our show. We have a special presentation today. We're doing um, our semi-annual roundtable looking at issues that are affecting um, Japan, China, and the Asia region. I have with us three very special guests, uh, repeat guests from previous shows. We'll be starting um, with Jiri Maseki, who's a partner at Kitahama Law Firm in Osaka. Jiri is a regular on the show. Thank you very much, Jiri, for participating. Jiri is uh, <clears throat> very interested in the topic today, which is the impact of the Ukraine invasion uh, on Asia. We also have Robert Eldridge, who was on my show just a month ago. So Robert, you're, you're doing overtime officially uh, in terms of your participation in the show. Robert's the head of his own think tank and has a very illustrious career in political science with Osaka University and other institutions in the Kansai area. And then Paul, who I think is our uh, returning champion, Paul has been on my show, I think more than anybody else. Paul is a professor emeritus from Kansai Gaida University. He is also now professor at the Catholic University of Lille. Did I say that right, Paul? That's correct. Okay, <clears throat> and he lives in Paris. So he's going to give us uh, an overview of how this war is being perceived in Europe. So that's what I want to start with, guys, is uh, taking a look at the impact of this war on the various regions that you guys are familiar with. Uh, one reason I want to do this is that my class last week, uh, I was doing a Zoom class, and I have several students from Austria. And uh, they began to text to each other, and I think that they thought that they were just texting among themselves but they were actually text, texting openly. And uh, they were making many comments about the war. And uh, so I brought it up as a subject. <clears throat> and even though, of course, this issue is reported daily in Japan, I could tell those students were taking it much more personally, uh, <clears throat> that there was an emotional element to it, almost to the point where one student was in tears uh, about this issue. <clears throat> so Paul, why don't I start with you, since you're in Europe, how is this war being perceived? <clears throat> well, it's an interesting question. If I were to drive from Paris to uh, Kiev, uh, it would take 25 hours. It's almost exactly the distance between uh, New York and Miami, about uh, 2,000 uh, something miles. And the war in uh, Europe has, um, has been a shock. Uh, Europe at war again, although um, uh, not an EU country. And it certainly uh, did absolutely the opposite of uh, what Mr. Putin uh, could have dreamed uh, that would happen, and that is uh, Germany, uh, which has always underspent its uh, military budget, um, and has been criticized for that as well, that the new government has pledged uh, $113 billion this year alone to modernize uh, its, its, uh, its country's uh, weapons. There is some debate. Uh, muted about whether um, uh, the Europeans want to see uh, German Germany uh, uh, rearm, uh, and Germany, a lot like Japan, uh, has it's a very, very, very long German word about uh, 17 letters, which is not uncommon in German. Uh, they have a public debate uh, about what they call the problematic period of its recent history. Uh, that is, of course, uh, National Socialism, Nazism, and uh, basically um, to, um, in, within the Japanese context, it would be to become normal, whatever that means. Uh, France, um, uh, France and Mr. Macron, who is up for a re-election, um, has uh, been a lead uh, in this, and uh, his uh, um, uh, approval ratings or at least the polling for uh, April is that uh, he will sweep in uh, to election, and uh, um, in part because of his uh, his handling uh, his handling of this. And maybe if I can make one uh, one comment, um, uh, Europe, as we all know, is heavily dependent on Russia for its oil and uh, gas. Two fifths uh, of the gas Europeans burn come from Russia. Um, uh, so Europe uh, is really dependent on Russia, uh, extraordinarily so. And maybe one more uh, point, um, I don't want to, uh, is that um, I asked my class this the other day, um, who has a bigger economy, Italy or Russia? Um, and the answer is Italy. 
Um, so when we talk about uh, uh, a powerful Russia, um, we um, we have to uh, look at really how strong that economy is. Absolutely energy dependent. Uh, most likely, sixty percent of its uh, GDP is energy related. Um, there is a lot of debate about uh, you know strengthening NATO. Um, I think there's. There's not as much hysteria, if I could use that, as in as in the United States, at least the commentary uh, uh, on BBC and on uh, France 24 and uh, on uh, Deutsche Welle and uh, all these things I, I watch and the newspapers has been, uh, uh, they talk about total war and it's, and they talk about um, uh, a war in uh, World War Three, which is completely which it's not, you know, the Russian army is not going to go through the Fulda Gap and be at the English Channel in two weeks. Uh, this is uh, this is hysteria. Uh, so that's less. It's more muted here because it's so close. Mm. Okay. Thank you, Paul. <coughs> Excuse me, Jerry. So you're an American living yes, in Japan. Yes, I'll, 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 yeah. But I you also, I want to point out that you are also a Czech mm -hmm. citizen. I am, yeah. And an official representative of the Czech government? Are you still? You well, still no, old? I, I uh, am, am not an official uh, representative of the Czech government, but, you know, I have been involved here uh, in, in Japan with the Czech community and the European community, uh, members of various uh, chambers of commerce, French chamber, German chamber. So, yeah, I, I, I come at this from from uh, a number of, of angles, as you said, uh, as the, sort of the American uh, angle, uh, the European angle is a Czech and European uh, and, you know, also living here in Japan. And it's very interesting that each of the different sort of uh, strands that I just mentioned and, and perspectives are different. Uh, Japan looks at this different than many in, in the United States, uh, than many in, in, in Europe, and particularly, you know, Central and, and uh, uh, Eastern Europe, which, is, as you noted, Steve, is where your Austrian students were also located. And for people there, it really is, uh, and even more than Austrians, Czechs, Poles, uh, Romanians, who were once part of the uh, Soviet empire, if you will, uh, do have a, a very, very um, uh, emotional uh, reaction uh, to also having been dominated. Czechs in particular, you know, before it was the Czech Republic, it was Czechoslovakia. And the Czechoslovakia has been mentioned sort of in in, in two major contexts in this conflict. The first is what happened in 1938 uh, when uh, Hitler was, uh, you know, basically the Munich uh, conference and Hitler was allowed to take the Sudetenland, which is, uh, sir, you know, uh, land where, where ethnic Germans lived around uh, the, the Czech lands. And that led to the total, you know, annexation and overtaking, you know, uh, the, the Nazis coming into, into Prague. And then in 1968, uh, the uh, Czechoslovakia was uh, was invaded uh, by uh, the, the Russians as well as other uh, Soviet bloc countries. So, particularly for Czechs, it it is a, a very sort of emotional uh, issue to the point that I, I think you probably saw in the news that the three prime ministers, uh, the Polish prime minister, Slovenian prime minister, and the Czech prime minister went to Kiev. Uh, during uh, the re recent hostilities, last month, I believe it was, to show uh, solidarity for Zelensky. So, yes, it is, is you know, coming at it from, from uh, these, these three different directions is, is um, yeah, it, it, it's an extremely uh, troubling conflict. You know, if I could add, I had Polish students, and, uh, you know, you're completely right, uh, Judy, that, that, that if we can talk about the Eastern Europe, yeah, their experience uh, with Russia uh, is much, much different than than here in France. Um, so a lot of emotion, uh, completely correct, uh, the Polish students, and no matter how much people uh, would criticize, and, and with, with, with good cause, uh, NATO expansion, the Poles really wanted it, and so did the Baltic states. Uh, uh, they... Uh, they really, really wanted that. Um, so that's uh, there's no, no no debate there. Um, yeah, checks too. <laughs> absolutely. That's exactly my point. Yeah, yeah exactly right. I'm yeah, sorry. Okay. Hey, Robert, why don't we turn to you as uh, our representative in terms of the impact of this invasion on Japan from your perspective? You're not Japanese, but you're a Japanese expert. <laughs> and I know you have contacts everywhere. 
it's remarkable your network. I'm always amazed at the people that you know. What, what are you picking up in terms of how this invasion is being perceived in Japan and also the subsequent change in relationship potentially between Japan and Russia, which historically has uh, not been so good after World War II anyway? <clears throat> right. And um, yeah, I would invite uh, you know, read our listeners to view our show last month. Uh, that you alluded to before, uh, we went into a great discussion, I think, on um, the uh, impact on uh, Russian-Japanese relations. But um, I'd like to thank you for inviting me again uh, today. Um, it's it's great to see uh, Paul Scott, uh, with whom I was extremely close in, in Kansai. And uh, Paul and I worked on a book about 20 years ago oh on another war. And the uh, co-editor is a different Paul but uh, our Paul Scott contributed a chapter to this book. It's on uh, public opinion during the, um, the war on terrorism and particularly uh, from 2001 and then again with the uh, invasion of, of uh, Iraq. Um, so it's, it's great to be working with him on another project again right now, this, uh, uh, this <laughs> series. Um, and also, uh, Jerry was a, uh, a classmate at Colby University uh, at the same time, uh, different, uh, in different offices, different uh, uh, faculty members who are studying under, but um, this show is allowing us to, to reunite and I appreciate that. Um, with regard to Japan, I think uh, Japan really had no choice uh, but to join you know, the Western uh, alliance uh, you know, against Russia, um, you know, particularly joining the sanctions. Uh, also, the uh, foreign minister uh, uh, recently visited the region, uh, particularly uh, you know, meeting with uh, Polish leaders about accepting um, uh, Ukrainian uh, refugees uh, to Japan, and they uh, mobilized a, a government uh, aircraft to to help relocate. Uh, Ukrainian citizens to to Japan. Um, so uh, I was kind of relieved uh, to see Japan uh, step up quickly. Uh, as we know, in the past, it's usually been uh, somewhat slow in making decisions uh, of such consequence. Although after the war on terrorism, uh, the then prime minister uh, very quickly uh, relayed his you know, his sympathy uh, to the United States, for example. So uh, Japan over the past 20 years, at least, has been um, kind of more and more in step with the international community. Um, here in Japan, I think the the, the real concerns uh, have been about what does this mean uh, for China, uh, with China's intentions vis-a-vis uh, -vis Taiwan, as well as the terrible dispute it has with Japan uh, in you know, the form of the Senkaku Islands. So many people are in Japan are watching it from that, from that angle. Uh, what are the lessons that China is drawing from Ukraine's uh, or Russia's invasion of Ukraine? Uh, another thing uh, that, and we talked about the, the last show about how this will affect uh, Russian and Japanese relations. And uh, shortly after we did our show together, um, uh, Russia, uh, basically uh, announced its discontinuation of peace talks with Japan uh, on a peace treaty, which it hasn't signed uh, with Japan. Uh, and uh, a couple of days after that, uh, Ukraine's President Zelensky addressed the, uh, the parliament, the diet here in Japan. Um, there are a couple other things that I've noticed. So there, there is a, a great deal of distrust in uh, the media reporting of the war. Um, there's a, a tendency to uh, to be all in on Ukraine and not giving a more balanced perspective about the uh, the background to the conflict and what's really going on in Russian decision making. So I think it's um, uh, increased the distrust that many in the in the general public in Japan have towards the media, and I think we see that in other countries as well. Uh, and then. On a final note, uh, since we're talking about the larger uh, Indo-Pacific region, I think it's important to, to mention India uh, in this discussion. And there's a lot of criticism about India's stance uh, on, on this issue. And 
but there's a sort of a double standard that when China uh, is, you know, acts neutral in this, it's given a pass. But when India does, it's not given a pass. Um, but I would argue that India, um, because of its longstanding relations with Russia, uh, is in a much more delicate uh, position in some ways. Um, uh, you know, for example, 85% of Indian weapons come from Russia um, and roughly the same percent of um, oil uh, that India imports also comes from Russia. So, that, and also foreign policy wise, uh, roughly 100% of, of Russia and the former Soviet Union's um, voting in the United Nations have, has been in favor of, of India. So that country is really, really dependent on on Russia, um, and um, and yet we've been extremely, you know, critical of India's stance on this. And um, mm -hmm. I think one of the aspects of this conflict is that we, I think, we all need to be more aware of where certain countries are coming from, and it's not necessarily in the response, but in the day-to-day -day interactions where we build that trust. And mm -hmm. I don't think we've done a good job with building trust with India over the past you know 75 years and that's an area that we need to learn from hmm. interesting we do have a question uh, from uh, viewers that came in and it actually it, it's to the point that robert was making about what china will take away from this invasion of ukraine vis-a-vis -vis its uh, relationship with taiwan so paul maybe you have some thoughts about that uh, obviously the invasion has not succeeded, at least on the terms of what it seemed like Putin wanted to accomplish initially. And to your point, Europe has moved dramatically against Russia. So uh, there's been that re ramification as well. Do you think that this invasion would make China less likely to engage in a conflict with Taiwan, maybe over the next five to 10 years? Or would, does it make no difference at all? Well, I think it makes a great difference. Um, and I think one one great takeaway from this is uh, is uh, Russia, um, China has zero experience in conducting uh, uh, op uh, military operations at sea. Uh, the United States certainly has great experience. Um, and uh, uh, the invasion of Ukraine uh, planned uh, by the uh, by the Russians was inept. Uh, logistics support all of these things uh, so um, uh, uh, so crossing a hundred miles or crossing the Taiwan sta Straits and invading uh, invading uh, um, uh, uh, Taiwan um, uh, it is an extraordinarily much more complicated military operation um, and um, uh, if, I, if I were China I would I would think about that a little more carefully than um, than believing uh, the propaganda, their own propaganda, uh, about how weak and um, uh, the U.S. military is. And by the way, the U.S. military is not as strong, especially at sea, as it should be. Uh, but it is incredibly capable. Robert knows this, and I know this as well. Uh, so that would be one take uh, one takeaway. Um, mm. <coughs> Jerry, do you have a, any thoughts on this? No, I, I, I totally agree. You know, the, the, the question uh, other, you know, there's, of course, the question of of the impact of our on Taiwan of of what the West and other other countries doing uh, against China. I will also be interested to see um, what impact it has on uh, Chinese expansionism in other ways, for example, the artificial islands. Uh, and the much more aggressive, you know, military operations that they're doing in the South China Sea. I'm wondering if they're going to pause before they um, keep doing that, because over the years that, you know, China has become much more uh, aggressive and blatant and not just toward Taiwan, toward the Philippines, toward towards other countries as well. And I'm 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 wondering if they're going to, you know, think about doing that. I'm also wondering whether or not other countries, again, in the region are going to themselves get a little bit more aggressive and tell China that if they do continue, you know, with the you know closing off of certain uh, trade routes at, or sea routes and also with the uh, artificial islands, whether or not they're, they're going to threaten, you know, consequences for that sort of expansionism. Robert, what are your comments about this? Uh, 
I'm sure you get asked this question many times. It, yes, I am. Uh, I I do agree with uh, with both comments, but um, I can't help but play the devil's advocate. And having uh, you know served as the political advisor in the Marine Corps, um, um, and uh, interacting with uh, the other services and and throughout our government as a whole, I can't help but be worried about the ability to um, to mitigate, uh, you know, a, an attempt by China um, to invade to invade Taiwan. Um, I, I kind of think that we we believe our own propaganda too, and um, mm -hmm. there's a I think a tendency when we we look at this uh, China Taiwan issue that um, a lot of the peaceniks will say, yeah, China has no intention to invade Taiwan. So they dismiss it that way. And on the right, there's a tendency to uh, dismiss uh, Chinese capabilities. And so both of those views are, I think, are incorrect. Um, we need to be aware of China's will or intention, uh, which they've, dem they've called for for the entire uh, you know, period of their existence, uh, the PRC. And their capabilities have grown dramatically over the past 20, uh, 20 some years. Essentially, as of 2015, they were militarily uh, capable of, of seizing Taiwan if they wanted to. Mm. In the interim, the past seven years, their, uh, their fusion of civilian and military um, capabilities has, has only grown dramatically, uh, as have their military capabilities. Um, the Trump administration tried to to stop that, uh, but there's been a, a long de decay over the years. Um, uh, we also have the U.S. has the tyranny of distance it has to solve. Uh, Taiwan is much much closer to China than than it is to Hawaii, you know, Guam, Hawaii, or or continental uh, U.S. And I think a a, a Chinese attack is going to be sooner rather than later. It doesn't mean that the Ukraine situation hasn't given China pause about its its planning or its concept of operations. If anything, I think it's it's um, it's allowed China to see what's gone well for Russia and what hasn't gone well. Um, and the reason I say it's going to be sooner rather than later, if you remember uh, exactly a year ago, uh, a year and a month ago, Admiral Davidson from Hawaii from um, the Indo-Pacific Command uh, said that China would likely take uh, Taiwan or try to take Taiwan uh, anywhere from 10 or maybe even six years. And it was unclear why he mentioned six years. But in my research, I, th I think the reason is because China has an advantage in uh, attacking uh, satellites. Um, and the uh, U.S. and its allies won't have the true capability to defend the satellites for another five years or so. So last year, he said six years. I think it's because of the uh, the plans to introduce the, the satellite, you know, defense system in, um, and that's not the official name, but the satellite defense system in 2026, which I think is probably behind schedule because of COVID and the supply chain issues, particularly with semiconductors. So it might not be until 2027. Um, my point is that I think China is going to move more quickly rather than later down the road. Mm, that's interesting. So to the extent that the Japanese government agrees, Robert, with your premise, you know, I don't know if they do or not. I, the, the Japanese government had been, even prior to the invasion, maybe in the last couple of years or so, attempting to build a stronger relationship uh, diplomatically and otherwise with Taiwan as a part of a counter to the expansionist policies of China. Do you think that that will accelerate now if, if indeed what you say is correct or Japanese, high Japanese government officials agree with your, your perspective on this? I, I hope it, I hope it proceeds. Uh, you do? I've okay. been calling for a, a Taiwan Relations Act for Japan uh, since 2018. And they haven't done that. A lot of the pronouncements are basically political and, and uh, diplomatic. But right. the best way to defend Jap Taiwan, the best way to defend Taiwan is to end its diplomatic isolation. 
Hmm, interesting. Paul, do you have any thoughts on that? Absolutely. It's uh, the uh, messaging from the United States has to be uh, uh, unambiguous. There has to be uh, clarity. Uh, and I agree with Robert uh, completely. Uh, if if uh, China does decide uh, uh, to attack, uh, um, it is the tyranny of distance uh, as well for the Americans. Uh, there's uh, uh, there's only one aircraft carrier in the Pacific, home ported in Japan. Um, I would recommend uh, uh, at least one more. Uh, and absolutely, uh, uh, sanctions are not going are going to are not going to be uh, an effective deterrent. Um, and uh, uh, there has to be, a, like I said, absolute um, uh, clear messaging uh, uh, from the United States. Um, and there is some talk. Uh, some chatter uh, as far as Ukraine that um, um, to raise this that you know really um, uh, some people are saying uh, that they don't want Putin to lose. In other words, uh, they're not giving Ukraine the type of weapons it needs and it's asking and begging for more offensive weapons. Mm. And really, they want a negotiated settlement, um, and uh, they do not want uh, uh, to turn uh, Russia. Uh, we don't want this to be a, a Versailles peace treaty, so to speak, uh, with Russia coming back even stronger and more vengeful, uh, sort of an equivalent of a giant North Korea, uh, distrustful and vengeful and isolated. Um, so that is uh, those um, those messages um, um, and uh, the emotion, especially. Uh, um, uh, in uh, parts of Europe and in the United States um, on, on Ukraine, whether that can be, uh, it's very, very high, high, whether that can be transferred to Taiwan uh, would be an interesting question that I have no answer for. There's, I think there's one interesting parallel between Russia and Ukraine and China and Taiwan. Both Ru Russia believes that Ukraine is, is, isn't a separate state, right? It's a part of Russia. And China, of course, believes exactly the same thing. Sure. So Jerry, we're running out of time, but I want to give you the, the last word if you want to comment about this at all. Yes, I, I, I agree with the uh, previous comments about, you know, m maybe the challenges. The other thing I think to remember is there is, in East Asia, we don't have an EU equivalent. We don't have a NATO equivalent. And if there were to be uh, military action, it would really be interesting to see which countries would, you know, align? Would there be this forceful response oh. that, 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 that you have in Europe? And I don't know that that would be the case. That's a fascinating observation, Jerry, and maybe a topic for another show. <laughs> Fortunately, guys, we've run out of time. I, I wish I had another half hour. I have more questions I, I want to pose here. But I do want to end on this one positive note. Robert talked about the initiative on the part of a, a Japanese government to host Ukrainians. I was contacted a few days ago by uh, an agency that's working with ICU, International Christian University up in Tokyo, and they're hosting Ukrainian students. So I'm starting that initiative now for Kansai Gaidai, and potentially we're gonna have some Ukrainian students on our campus mm -hmm. uh, to offer them a safe place to be um, while things are sorted out for, for them, hopefully soon. We'll have to see how this all goes. Robert, Paul, Jiri, thank you so much for participating. Uh, I think I'm going to have to petition for more time when I get the three of you guys together again. Maybe we'll do an hour-long special show because uh, half an hour is just not enough time to cover these issues. Very, very interesting conversation and insights by all of you. Um, actually, Jerry, I'm thinking maybe contacting Andrew in Taiwan and do a show with him. But, uh, Andrew's yeah. a friend of ours who heads the Chamber of Absolutely. Commerce in Taiwan. Yes. Might be mm -hmm. interesting to do a show on that. Yeah, I All know, right, Andrew, everyone. very interesting. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, guys, for participating. Enjoyed it. Uh, thank you for our viewers. If you have any comments, uh, please send them to Think Tank Hawaii. Or um, even better than that, uh, there's a fundraising campaign going on right now with Think Tank. Uh, if you uh, like this show or shows like this, the 30 some odd shows on Think Tank, please contribute uh, to the cause. And uh, I'll see you again in two weeks. Thank you, everyone. Thanks again, guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.